Well, good morning, everyone. I guess we'll make a start then on today's session, which is the uh, University of Strathclyde Clyde's Engage Series webinar on what have we learned from COVID and opportunities for, and insights for manufacturing regeneration. So I'm your host, Chris Dungey, the MS Re Research Director. So over the next two hours, we have a great opportunity to understand the impact that COVID has had on the manufacturing community with a focus on immediate support given and also key insights for the future of manufacturing. So we have an excellent lineup today from both the local and global industry, and of course, uh, Scott government, Scottish government as well. So we're very privileged to have these, these people on board today. And also we have speak, key speakers from innovation providers within, within the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult, the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland and the University of Strathclyde. So before we begin, I'd just like to do a piece on the housekeeping. So the webinar is being recorded, recorded and will be available on the MS YouTube channel. Your microphones and webcams will be turned off during the session to avoid background noise. You can type your questions throughout the session via the chat tool, so we have a Q&A function embedded within this. So please direct any questions into that appropriate box. Um, we'll cover those off later uh, after the presentations have been completed and of course, during the panelist Q&A session as well. So hopefully that's clear. So in terms of the agenda, what I'd like to do is give you a brief introduction and a bit of context around the session today. I'd then like to speak in a bit more detail about the MS COVID response, give an overview of what we've undertaken today and key insights for the future. But also what I'd like to introduce as well is the Scottish Government's Manufacturing Recovery Plan, which is um, in a very advanced state of formation and about hopefully about to be launched in the very near future. Uh, we're also going to look at the effect of COVID-19 on UK manufacturing. So my colleague Jill is going to cover that session. And then Tom will be covering mapping the impact of COVID on your ecosystem, examples from healthcare and opportunities for manufacturing. And then my colleague Chin will then be looking at a specific manufacturing opportunity, particularly looking at repurposing and upgrading injection molding production lines for component manufacturing for medical supplies. So some really interesting work's been undertaken there. Then what we'd like to do is drop into a presentation Q&A session to be followed by the panel discussion as well. And then I'll, I'll give a brief wrap up before one o'clock, uh, half one it is. Okay, so without further ado, so in terms of a, a brief introduction here, um, what I'd like to have a look at in terms of the context of the impact that COVID has had upon society as a whole, but particularly the Scottish manufacturing industry, it's been quite substantive in terms of the impact here, and I don't need to obviously communicate that in too much uh, detail in terms of the complete impact on society and communities and industry as a whole. But in terms of the manufacturing economy in Scotland, it was worth 12.5 billion in GVA to the economy and employed almost 170,000 people. So it's a substantive employer, particularly when you look at the advanced nature of what's achieved there and the overseas exports, as it were, and also the, the uh, investment in R&D is quite a substantial part of the economy. However, due to COVID, output contracted substantially or over 23%. And that's from quarter two 2019, reflecting on the same period in 2020. So it has been a substantive uh, impact here. And nearly half of all manufacturing businesses have reported a decrease in turnover as a result of COVID-19, which is clearly understandable. 83% of manufacturing businesses have applied for the furlough scheme, so a substantive take up there, which has been very welcome though, in terms of the ability to um, ultimately hope and hopefully retain many of those uh, or jobs going forward past the end of the furlough phase. But manufacturing businesses across the UK expect sales, investment and employment to all decrease over the next four quarters. So the, the, the issues there are still going to be short to medium term uh, in terms of the widespread impact on the economy as a whole, but particularly within manufacturing. However, there have been some interesting observations and pivot, pivots as well, particularly with Scottish firms pivoting towards PPE manufacture, particularly looking at hand sanitizers, face masks, and this is really helping to tackle the COVID pandemic and obviously create um, value job, valuable jobs in that particular context. So in summary, there's been a, you know, Scot manufacturing within Scotland is a really important substantive sector. It's been substantially impacted by COVID um, across a number of levels and a number of sectors within manufacturing. But there are a number of opportunities now appearing and organisations taking benefit as we have some of those newer opportunities that are now being realised, particularly around the PPE context and others as we will explore today. 
So just a few slides then before we drop into the main part of the presentation. But what I'd like to do is give you a brief overview of EMIS, our COVID response, and an introduction really and an overview to the Scottish Government's Manufacturing Recovery Plan. So in terms of the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland, so what is this entity? So it's a group of industry-led manufacturing R&D facilities where research, industry, and the public sector work together to transform skills, productivity, and innovation to attract investment and really make Scotland the global leader in advanced manufacturing. So we are bringing together a wide ecosystem here, innovation ecosystem, skills ecosystem to enable this um, leadership in advanced manufacturing within Scotland. In terms of the new headquarter facility, um, hopefully you'll see my slides now, the new building that's under construction will be open in September 2022. We're very much building upon the um, pedigree and the world leading capabilities as part of the Advanced Forming Research Centre, the AFRC, which is now a specialist facility within the ENMIS group. But what you see on the page in front of you now is the new ENMIS headquarter building. So hopefully this will play um, in terms of a fly through of the building. So what we're doing now is entering into the main area, uh, the, the main entrance. So once we go into the main entrance area, you'll, you'll get a feel for the, the layout of the facility in terms of how open it is and accessible as well. So we're meant to be working very closely with industry and the wider stakeholders and bring them into this space to enable rapid innovation and explo exploitation of technologies. So what you'll go on to shortly is the actual digital factory, which is within the MS headquarter facility. So this environment now we're heading into, um, and there's the airport, Glasgow airport out on the left uh, through those windows. This is the new MS uh, digital factory facility, which I'm directly responsible for in terms of pulling the vision together and, and actually developing um, the kind of the innovation impact within this environment. So we are now currently designing um, activities within this space for opening in September 2022. So hopefully you'll get appreciation of how exciting this project is and will be open um, and very shortly. In terms of MS, it's, it's part of a, an integrated um, uh, proposition as a way around manufacturing and it's called the One Scotland Team, Making Scotland's Future. So it's, it's a very much a national asset and has a national mandate for manufacturing innovation across Scotland. It's operated by the University of Strathclyde, supported by several key stakeholders, particularly being the Scottish Government and various entities within the Scottish Government, particularly Scottish Enterprise, Hollands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, Scottish Funding Council, Renfrewshire Council, where we're currently located within that facility, and of course the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult, which is a pan-UK um, construct around manufacturing innovation and skills. In terms of the NMIS innovation ecosystem, I'll just very brief, briefly do this slide and introduce this to you, but essentially we work across this technology readiness levels, TRLs one through nine, uh, connecting the wider eco innovation system together. So we typically work within the implied R&D environment, so four, five and six, but very much working in partnership with these organisations highlighted on this page, particularly the with Scottish Research Partnership and Engineering, SRPE, working with the Scottish universities and bringing their innovations to bear as it were, on behalf of the manufacturing community, which is on the right hand side. As I mentioned, we very much work in this applied R&D environment, connecting together the high value manufacturing catapult, and we are the only high value manuf manufacturing catapult entity within Scotland. So that, that was a quick overview of MMIS. In terms of our direct response and support during the pandemic, and it cur currently uh, uh, plays out, as it were, in terms of our intervention and support here. So, so at the beginning of the outbreak, in a little more than eight weeks, team of more than 20 colleagues from MMIS's business development group worked very hard here to, to respond to many hundreds of companies who opted to help with manufacturing for the NHS. So this team actually addressed more than 700 inquiries, spoke to more than 400 companies, organisations and individuals who offered support and ensured 210 opportunities were, were reviewed by Team Scotland. And I must uh, highlight Team Scotland's role here. It's brought together very rapidly to focus on the pandemic and how we bring multi-agencies together, particularly from NHS, Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, SMAS and MMIS and others, uh, focused on how we support industry and the wider communities during this time, these times. And we was broken down into various working groups, such as looking at PPEs and within that masks and visors and gowns and, and so on. So it's a very um, um, slick as it, in terms of bringing those organizations together and making actually timely and relevant responses as well. In addition to this, we, we offered uh, within the MS research and engineering community, 
uh, collectively over 80 ideas to help fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. And many of those looking at uh, manufacturing of CE compliant masks and visors um, and looking at many other aspects, which I'll touch on very shortly during this presentation. So in terms of the, just a bit of a recap there, we, we have substantially helped the Scottish Government on this general inquiries fielding, as I presented on the previous slide. We very much worked in partnership with Transport Scotland and other stakeholders to look at developing uh, relevant grants and interventions to, have, to develop safe transport modes. So given the opportunity, for instance, for the train networks and taxi drivers, for instance, to look at what is safe in that space to offer advice, but also offer um, what solutions would enable more effective and safer journeys. So looking at, for instance, Perspex interiors for taxis, how they actually go about acquiring those and achieving grants through Transport Scotland to enable that. So some very, again, rapid response work, very timely interventions and had a, a big impact in this space. In terms of more direct work we undertook at MS was particularly looking around the manufacturing of visors and face shields. We actually developed it a product ourselves working in partnership with a number of organizations uh, so we delivered over six or almost 16,000 units to various char charities and organizations across scotland and beyond uh, what we did develop here was a manufacturing framework and guidance here for industry so we released this to the wider community with great feedback on how to actually navigate the regulatory requirements faced in this particular environment and how you go about designing and innovating new products and hitting the market quite quickly from that point of view and again i'll touch on that um, shortly. We also looked at innovative ideas around uh, helping surgeons work more safely within the operating environment, looking at what are called medical loops. So you may have um, seen on previous, uh, previous um, shows here, medical shows, where they have these little uh, microscopic lenses that drop in front of glasses. Well, unfortunately, those aren't sealed and therefore felt unsafe by the surgeons. So we were direct, directly contacted by surgeons within Scotland and England to look at more um, so kind of safer designs, looking at sealed units, as you can see, so on the right hand side of this slide. So what we developed here was a design, virtually kind of design that, that aspects, looking at advanced 3D geometries. And then we actually built the design as well using uh, current off the, off the shelf, as it were, goggles, but actually 3D printing plastic inserts with the um, lenses, as it were, and, and actually fused them onto, onto the goggles. So we actually created a design that was safe fit for use and actually been trialed with great success within uh, the medical field and of course we did some great work with within the uh, transparent face mask um, market as we're helping organizations to understand the requirements and develop products and ultimately hopefully very shortly going in to sell those to the nhs in terms of looking at the ppe context in a bit more detail so i misreceived over uh, almost 722 inquiries around covid ppe opportunities uh, sorry, of, of which 269 related to PPE. Again, we fielded these via the Team Scotland approach, focusing on the PPE strand. Although we had a, a range of opportunities that came in and inquiries around individual sewing scrubs for care homes to an offer of 50 million FFP3 masks to be given out to organisations within Scotland and the NHS on the whole. We also looked at the certified production advisors and developed the guidance and the routes forward regarding that aspect. As I highlighted, almost 16,000 units were manufactured on site at MMIS and, and dispersed accordingly. And also we undertook several new product design reviews, particularly looking at these transparent face mask designs and local exhaust ventilation systems for hospital beds to make sure um, patients are feel more safe in that environment and getting more um, exposure to highly ventilated air. And also the medical loops type, type situation I presented earlier. In terms of the standards, so what we did here was understood these standards and um, procurement aspects in a lot of detail. So what we developed here was looking at the medical visors and face shields aspects, the design, manufacturing and procurement flow chart from the UK government working in accordance with, the, with BASE's uh, overarching approach here and the Office of Product Safety and Standards. So what we helped develop here was guidance and support for industry borrowing the inquiries we were we were fielding we're looking at how you from stage one to stage five look at prototyping all the way through to production of products and what we developed here and worked through this is in terms of our guidance and frameworks looking at how we prototypes looking at various facets from material selection uh, independent testing and certification what are the requirements there what are the pinch points and what are the things that will make for a successful product and ultimately 
um, sales, as it were, enable sales in this particular space. Also, we particularly looked at um, the submission aspects into the Office of Product Safety and Standards, so helping organisations understand that, that kind of environment. Then looking really at the manufacturing setup, so what is required from not just the design, but how you take the design into the, the manufacturing aspects, looking at tooling, manufacturing the first runs, reviewing this with NHS key stakeholders and their various uh, tests and standards and certification that was required to enable that. Then looking at how you actually award contracts, so looking at those aspects with the Office of Product Safety and Standards, and then really helping organisations get into the full rate production, understanding how you undertake that, looking at sterilisation aspects, inclusion of, of instructions, and also looking at logistical, logistical aspects in the supply chain as well. So it's a very comprehensive intervention there, and that's still open in terms of being able to interact with MNIST and the Team Scotland partners to understand this environment in more detail and how we can help the businesses take, uh, take this forward. In terms of the Breathe Easy story, so this is one of our key success stories, working in partnership with Team Scotland and Breathe Easy, of course, the organisation here, looking at this transparent mass design as shown on the right-hand side, so this is the latest design. So we looked at the requirement for COVID use, looking at many aspects here from bacteria filtering, it, filtering effectiveness, uh, splash resistance, microbial cleanliness, breathability. There's a whole key factors here that we have to be understood by the manufacturer and go for that regulatory framework as we presented earlier um, to help them through that to understand how to exploit that journey in the most effective and safe manner possible. Breathe Easy was supported by a number of organisations here, particularly NHS Scotland, the requirements and Scottish Enterprise, NHS Tayside, particularly the design evaluation in trials and SMAS, of course, looking at product and product production line layout. MS's support was particularly around advance advice rather on design standards and manufacturing. We work very closely with and connected into the National Physics Laboratory as well, particularly looking at their manufacturing recovery project, um, support on the mask testing aspects as well. So it's a great story here how we brought a community together to enable this opportunity. And we do believe it, um, Breathe Easy are very close in terms of discussions, as it were, and to understand what the opportunities for the NHS and hopefully we'll be developing orders in the very near future. Uh, just before I finish off, there's one more success story we'd like to highlight. And again, it, it leads into the Breathe Easy story in terms of this framework for developing new tools, uh, developing a new, new ideas and innovations. We developed a new tool in the framework to help organisations understand that landscape around successful product acceptance and deployments. So we work with a company called Astromar. It was funded by Innovate UK as part of their rapid response programme. And we had support from many organisations as highlighted on the page um, below. But in terms of uh, the director of Astromar, Elizabeth Gary, she mentioned that the MS team brought significant insights and product realisation expertise into the development of the tool in relation to both content and usability. They've also provided access to potential users valuable feedback from piloting the tool on a COVID-19 product development project. So again, it just gives you an, uh, an idea of, of different areas of um, support and expertise the collective have brought together here in a very rapid time frame. Just the last few slides then, just touching on the Scottish Government's Manufacturing Recovery Plan. So again, this is uh, still in its evolution, but it's about to be finalised and hopefully given the green light in terms of launching activity very shortly. But the aim here of the Manufacturing Recovery Plan was to propose a series of actions for public agencies, industry and academia to take forward by the end of this year. They're designed to secure a strong, sustainable future for manufacturing sector across four independent priority areas. So this essentially, this is at the heart of the recovery plan for manufacturing. So there is a link on this slide to the actual document. So please, please feel free to um, check that out after this presentation. In terms of the four key areas, collaboration and networks, supply chain and competitiveness, uh, competitiveness, adaption and transformation of skills and workforce. It's bringing a kind of the broad con construct together, the key areas that need to be worked on and worked together in a synergistic fashion to enable this manufacturing recovery plan. So in partnership with other stakeholders, MS have been working closely to inform and support the development of these programmes. And like I said, the um, actions from this will be um, shown and developed in, in the very near future. So in terms of uh, that concludes the kind of the intro part of the presentation, also the overview from MRIS regarding COVID response and the Scottish Government's Manufacturing Recovery Plan. What I'd like to do now is hand over to my colleague, Jill McBride. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. So Jill, I'll just hand over to yourself now to, to carry on with the presentation. Thanks very much, Chris. Well, clearly it's been a really busy time for you guys. Um, let me just share my screen. And 
just checking. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see the screen. It's not in presentation mode yet, though. Oh, wrong. We don't. Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's that's working. That's us now. Great. Okay, all good. Well, thank you very much. And um, my name's Jill McBride, and I'm a professor at Strathclyde University of Innovation and Operations Management. Um, so for the last six months, I've been working with some colleagues in NMIS on a project that's funded by UKRI, looking exactly at what we're talking about today, the impact of the pandemic on UK manufacturing. Now, Chris gave you some of the kind of highline, headline figures for the Scottish situation, and I'm going to start by kind of doing the same, but at a more of a UK level. So I should say our project, um, it is funded by UKRI, um, and we started out kind of looking at what's been happening um, to UK manufacturing. And we started by looking at other sources of information that's already there. So there was surveys have been done, there's regular um, sources of data from government statistics and so on. So we used that to get an initial feeling of what's been happening um, to UK manufacturing. But more recently, um, we've actually been out speaking to manufacturers and speaking to policymakers, support organisations, trade bodies. And we've combined that with a, a small survey and also um, we've done a number of events like this where we've actually conducted live polls. So there's a bit of information coming from all these sources. But if I start with the kind of our early on um, work when we were looking at secondary sources, um, some of the highlight figures from about output, jobs, sales and orders. So if I start with output, um, Chris talked about output of manufacturing in Scotland dropping by 23.1%. Now, obviously, early days is, is, is a very fluid situation. So if we look at the, the kind of start of lockdown, um, obviously, output dropped considerably. But in actual fact, many, many manufacturing businesses have been able to continue to manufacture. Some of them had to, sh had to um, shut early doors during the first lockdown if they weren't essential. But once they started kind of putting in safe ways of working, a lot of people did return to work. Now, there's been other reasons perhaps where, why um, output has been down. It might be lack of orders. It might be lack of supplies. Um, but UK-wide, um, we are kind of climbing back up, um, but we're still uh, comparing February 2021 with February 2020, so that was a, a, the year period, we're still about 4.2% down on manufacturing output in the UK. But there's lots of figures you might have seen recently in the last few weeks. There's lots of figures coming out painting quite a positive story. Um, so uh, uh, markets um, uh, statistics that came out just a few weeks ago show manufacturing growth being the fastest since February 2011. So that's basically we came from a lower point. We've been climbing um, and that's been, been um, happening in a fast way. But you also hear um, figures from coming out from the CBI um, about optimism for output. And the CBI report that came out recently said that two thirds of manufacturers expect output to rise in the next 12 months, whilst only 6% thought it would contract. Um, but then again, there's also very um, optimistic figures. The CBI also talks about um, optimism being at the highest level since 1973. Um, so we'll see what happens there. In terms of jobs, um, uh, obviously there was there was a, a, you know a lot of people did lose jobs again at the very start. But furlough um, has saved a lot of jobs, and I think Chris talked about eighty three percent of Scottish manufacturers using furlough, and the figure at a national level is around that um, eighty percent. A couple of things that concern me, particularly unemployment in the over fifties. Um, the people who did leave um, manufacturing businesses, quite a number have been in that older age group. Um, I think that's worrying because, um, you know, manufacturing, we already know, had a problem with an ageing workforce. But are we actually losing some key skills? And I think the other thing that concerns me a bit here is about, um, at the other end of the spectrum, people coming into manufacturing. The number of apprentices went down considerably. So if we actually look at the number of apprentices coming into manufacturing in the period March to July 2019, you were talking about nearly 6,000 people. 
But when you look at the period March to July 2020, you were down at closer to 2,500. So significant drops there. Um, sales, orders, turnover, we're getting quite a mixed um, picture there, depending really what kind of industry you're in. Um, you know, at the lowest point, um, uh, Make UK uh, did a survey that suggested that 80% of people had seen a drop in turnover, but it's a very mixed picture. So I'm going to talk now more about our interviews when we went out to speak to people and what did people want to talk about? Well, these are the kind of generic things that, that were common across practically every interview. So I'll take these first. And the first thing that people talked about um, was the government support. And people talked about furlough as being, you know, um, a lifesaver, um, helping with a fire break, a, a, allowing them to restart. So, you know, really um, a breathing space, other kind of words that people used. So there was a lot of praise for that kind of support. Um, less praise perhaps sometimes for the uncertainty. Chris talked about some of the direct action and um, we talked about the Scottish government there and how they actually worked with NMIS to create complete supply chains for PPE. And again, we've seen similar things um, happening in different parts of the country. So that's, that's quite a, a positive um, thing, I think, the, the ventilator challenge, PPE and so on. Everybody wanted to talk about working from home. Now, obviously, a lot of people um, in manufacturing were going to their manufacturing premises. But manufacturers, a lot of the back office people and um, the management teams are still working from home. And I think what's interesting there is just different attitudes you've got now, but people seeing different ways of doing things. So it, it, people are, are working in different ways. Now, obviously, because of when we were looking at this study, and really we were, I'm talking about the last six months, so from November 2020 to April 21, um, it's unsurprising that people wanted to talk about Brexit. But where it's really hard to unpick is what is Brexit um, impact and what is COVID impact? You know, we hear people talking about shortages of supply and delays and so on, but it's quite hard to unpick what the root cause is um, just in conversations with people. Now, if we move to manufacturing operations, the kind of things that people talked about was how the, the pandemic has accelerated their digital journey. Um, people have had to adopt um, more digital tools and speed things up there. People have talked about um, this kind of embracing of innovation, doing things differently. Quite often, speaking to their employees and having innovation come from the bottom up. So again, there's, there's positives there. But um, the other kind of impacts has been because people, it's more difficult to get on site. There's been delays in um, installing new equipment, for example, maintenance issues. Um, and as we just talked upon there, um, problems with supply and delays in things. So clearly different sectors have been touched in different ways. And I'm going to quickly just say, you know, automotive and aerospace, anything to do with transport has been impacted um, very hard. What we are seeing is um, both of these industries thinking very much about cost and controlling cost. So aerospace and automotive were, were some of the ones where we saw the biggest job losses as well. And um, lots of things have been paired back, training and so on as well, which is slightly worrying. Oil and gas, again, Chris kind of touched on that and the, some of the challenges of, um, of offshore working um, and getting people onto site. Um, has been hard. Food and drink, real mixed picture in food and drink. Um, obviously, if you're supplying um, pubs and uh, and outlets like that, they really had they really struggled and had to look at new ways of doing um, their business and setting up online stores and, and all sorts of things. But if you were supplying a supermarket, chances are your business has been quite good. Um, and there's a lot of people in the food and drink sector who are reporting very high. Um, order books, and uh, but they've not had the they've not had the same kind of downtime. A lot of them talked about firefighting, um, you know, emergency situations, trying to keep output up. And again, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, quite a mixed picture there. And um, obviously, lots of people in um, we talked to 
um, have been involved in testing or uh, vaccines and you know they've been working non-stop whilst others have struggled. Again, the uptake of things like virtual reality um, has really um, been important in some of these sectors. So some of our emerging themes, um, both in our conversations and in the kind of surveys, and I think there's, there's quite a lot of positives here. When we first started this project, I must admit, I did think we were going to come across like so many stories in manufacturing of job losses, of closures and so on. But for every sad story, there's a positive story. So there's a lot of positives in here. And for me, one of the, one of the positives is this innovation becoming the norm, which is very, very often the case in, in such situations. Um, but people are now open to doing th things differently. And as I say, there's a number of studies. There's one from the from um, London School of Economics. There's one from Make UK that gives you figures on accelerating the digital uptake and changing the way we work. So people are open to doing things differently. And I think we've got a good opportunity to seize that and make sure we, we do something good with it. We've heard a lot in the news about pivoting business model change. When you speak to people up close, very different stories there. Some are doing it for necessity, for like, um, you know, to bring money in in a very short space of time. But others, it's been a chance to stand back. And interesting that we've spoken to a number of people who have used the opportunity of furlough to actually stop their manufacturing as is and plan for the future. So different types of, of change there. Changes in supply chain, again, some positive new partnerships, for example, that Chris was talking about, um, people finding new partners, new, new ways of working, um, but also some problems um, within supply chain, long, long delays at the moment um, for lots of goods. Um, and as I say, it's quite hard to unpick the cause of that. We're hearing a lot of people talking about reshoring. Now, sometimes you hear that as a positive, but a lot of the sectors that we were, were talking to, your aerospace, your automotive, the supply chains are still buying a lot of their things not from in the UK. So I think there is a, 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 a real risk there. And as I say, issues around um, people, skills and talent and making sure that as we open up again and as things move forward, um, that we've got the right skills and the right people. So last couple of slides. Um, as I say, it has been a, a, a mixed picture, a lot of challenges, no doubt. Companies, some companies struggling to survive. But interestingly enough, um, there's actually been less bankruptcies in this manufacturing sector than there was pre-pandemic. And again, perhaps furlough and government support's got something to do with that. But many people, as that ends in September, um, will be struggling for their, um, you know, under financial constraints. We've already talked about supply chain and investing in new um, technology and digital. But in terms of opportunities, um, I do think there's, there's opportunity there. There's new businesses, there's new partnerships, new ways of working. And I think a lot of companies are ready to embrace that. And also coming back greener, the idea of a more sustainable future, um, which I think is one, again, it's an opportunity we've got and we really have to grab this. So just kind of finishing off, um, I should say, you know, it is such a fluid situation. We've been looking in the last six months, and as I say, we've not found the doom and gloom that we're expecting. Yes, there's been pockets um, where the people have been hit very hard, but there's also been a lot of positives. Um, but with furlough ending in September, um, there's still, I think, a lot of these impacts still to come. So I'm going to stop at that. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Tom. And Tom has been looking not at manufacturing, but a different sector completely. Um, and Tom has also been finding that innovation is a big thing there and that manufacturing has things to learn. So with that, I'll stop sharing and I'd welcome questions at the very end after, um, each of the, after all the presentations. So I'll stop sharing and hand over to Tom. Thanks so much, Jill. That's great. Right, I'm gonna go on to share screen now. So hopefully you can all see that. 
And um, as Jill was saying, I've been looking at um, healthcare and uh, healthcare systems. So that's what I'm going to uh, do my presentation on. I'm going to explain some of the work that I've been doing and uh, reflect on what the implications for that might be on uh, manufacturing. So my name is Tom Inns. I'm a visiting professor within the Department of Design, Engineering and Manufacturing Management at the University of Strathclyde. And I'm director of my own consultancy called CoFink Limited. And all of my work is based on developing processes and methods to help people collaborate, help professional teams collaborate in all sorts of diverse settings. So the work I'm going to be uh, explaining today is, um, Oh, just a moment, I'm just at the wrong end of the presentation, sorry about that. The work I'm going to be presenting today is uh, work that I've been doing um, within healthcare. And what I wanted to reflect on was the uh, some of the lessons that healthcare has been learning very systematically for over 20 years now from manufacturing and production. And based on some of that work, what we might then learn backwards from healthcare over the last 20 months. So over the last 20 years, healthcare has um, looked very closely at other sectors and has taken on all sorts of different uh, methodologies um, from manufacturing, from production, largely around uh, quality improvement. So many of those methodologies that have been um, adopted in car manufacturing and so on have been used within healthcare to look at patient pathways and look at how you um, optimize flow rates and so on. But over the last 20 months, obviously within healthcare, we've seen uh, all sorts of innovation take place. We've been watching this on our news feeds uh, as we've watched COVID unfold. We've seen all sorts of change in the way healthcare is delivered. Um, healthcare has had to uh, adopt and uh, all sorts of new innovations in order to deal with the, uh, the COVID pandemic. So thinking back to March last year, when we came to our first lockdown, as that was taking place, um, everybody within NHS and other healthcare systems around the world were rapidly uh, adopting new modes of working. And so what I want to do is I just want to kind of reflect on some of those lessons that might have been learned from there and see whether there's one small lesson that we can actually take back, particularly in this world of quality improvement and quality improvement tools. So my work within healthcare has been evolving over the last couple of years. Um, over the period March 2019 to March 2020, I was working very closely with NHS Tayside, which is one of the 14 healthcare boards within Scotland and NHS Education for Scotland. And we were doing a very interesting piece of work where we were taking some of the, uh, the quality improvement tools that the healthcare teams on a regular basis use on a regular basis. And we were augmenting them with a whole series of new tools which were very, very focused on looking at uh, the healthcare perspective from a patient perspective. So what we were effectively doing was bringing in a whole portfolio of new design tools. And the whole idea of these tools was to help these healthcare teams work collaboratively more effectively. So whenever you have a, a group of people working together, they always have different discipline knowledge, different contemporary knowledge, different network knowledge, different operations knowledge, different ways of thinking, um, different perceptions of constraints, different cultural sensitivities. And in most professional settings, we have to uh, get all of those different perspectives onto the table and get everybody to work together to understand the challenge, develop solutions and implement change. So this was very much at the heart of the work I was doing with the healthcare teams in Tayside in the period up to the pandemic. So this is all based around um, various design tools. And here's one of those design tools in action at very high speed was about creating templates to allow people to kind of think systematically together about the same topic so they could kind of share their understanding. And this group of people here are mapping out a patient journey from the patient perspective. So it's something that uh, is very, very useful. Everybody who works within healthcare, they work within big teams, only perhaps sees the patient perspective from one particular dimension. So it's very useful to share those perspectives as they kind of seek innovations in those systems. So that was very much the work that I was doing in, in uh, NHS Tayside up until March last year. Um, when we came to March last year, obviously um, we were entered the COVID pandemic, everything changed within the, uh, the healthcare system of Scotland, the UK and elsewhere. So um, the learning center within NHS Tayside where they do all their quality improvement was repurposed and turned into a, a COVID control hub. Uh, obviously they set up a new intensive care unit. they put in green pathways 
non-COVID pathways and COVID pathways into the hospital, totally uh, rewired the way the teams were working and made all sorts of other innovations. And by the time they came to about April, May, within about eight weeks, 10 weeks of working in this way, there was very much a feeling within NHS Tayside that um, they had managed to put through so much innovation in three months that they wanted to kind of very, very quickly reflect on that and learn from the whole experience of rewiring the healthcare system. Because they thought, well, we've actually done things which would have taken us three or four years to do in three or four weeks. So how is this? What is it that we've done to change? So I did some review work with them and with their um, clinical teams with NHS Education for Scotland. We did um, 10 workshops with their um, clinical teams drawn from across um, different parts of the hospital, the ICU staff, the consultants, the nurses, the allied health professionals and so on. And we systematically asked them through um, Teams workshops and Zoom workshops what it was that we could learn from how the system had been rewired. So actually many of the things that they were learning were very similar to the things uh, Jill was reflecting on, uptake in uh, digital platforms, new ways of collaborating across silos, uh, new ways of thinking about problems. They put in place a very different um, structure for making decisions. They put in a gold, silver, bronze command structure, set up all of these bronze innovation teams, which were um, dealing with generic issues, which cut right across uh, the different um, specialist areas of healthcare within uh, Tayside. And so there had been massive change in the way the culture of innovation worked within the system. So the key thing they wanted to do was um, learn what those lessons were. And they knew that with COVID hopefully having a half-life in some form, they could and would have to plan for remobilization and putting the services back at some point. But they wanted to kind of capture that learning so they could take some of those lessons learned forward into the future as they remobilized and redesigned their systems. So there was probably three key lessons for them. One was COVID impacts everything and did impact everything and continues to impact everything within NHS. So obviously we've seen what it does to intensive care units, but it also impacts what happens in your GP surgery, it impacts on waiting times, it impacts on perceptions of patients, it impacts on the training of uh, nurses and doctors within the clinical setting, it impacts on policy, it impacts on um, the interactions between different teams. So there's nowhere where COVID hasn't had an impact. Another thing which they all learned was we sometimes think of innovation as being a nice new shiny device, but we've discovered it's very much about new ways of working. So it was very much about people, people's attitudes, the culture of innovation, which has driven many of the new changes within the, the healthcare system. And another realization was that very often when we're thinking about quality improvement within healthcare, we drill down and focus in on a pathway or a specific issue and then make improvements. But what the whole system was crying out for was the need to take a single view of the state of risks, the drivers of change across the whole system. So getting the big view had become the kind of new challenge, particularly as they're kind of thinking of, of putting their healthcare uh, systems back. So in very much the way Jill has received funding from UKRI to support COVID research, uh, with the, uh, the team at Tayside and the team with Ed Edu Education for Scotland, we've secured through University of Strathclyde um, UKR funding to look at, could you actually go about developing new tools to help the team in this kind of COVID recovery process? So what we wanted to do was map the bigger ecosystem and support that mapping through a kind of online environment of Zoom and Teams and use those maps to understand risks and mitigations and more importantly, drivers of change and innovation. So how was the system going to change over the next 12 months? What were the implications of COVID going to be? And what's the innovation portfolio that comes out of that? We're very much inspired by the way other people map things. So the London Underground map I've got here on this visual, on the left-hand side, you can see the London Underground as it looks in reality. That's what the, where the tube stations are. There's obviously a stylized version which communicates it to all of us whenever we go to London. And that fits in a much bigger transport for London map with all the tube lines in it and so on. So we were looking at whether you could kind of create a similar kind of representation of the healthcare system um, to allow people to kind of see it holistically and, and see the, the individual pathways within it at the same time. So over the last couple of months, we've been building these uh, ecosystem maps. This is a very early prototype. 
This was for pharmacy services at NHS Tayside. So there's an awful lot going on in this map. We've got the core pharmacy services. On the left-hand side, we've got patient pathways. On the right-hand side, we've got policy and education that's going on for pharmacy. And um, if you work in the pharmacy team at Tayside, you'll probably be able to kind of work your way around this map. And, and it builds an understanding of what happens in the hospital and what happens within GP practices and within community pharmacy. So this was a very, very early run of the ecosystem map. Since then, we've um, made it so that it's um, more generic, so that we can use it across different uh, clinical pathways. And we've effectively found that the most effective way of mapping these things from a healthcare perspective is to imagine that we're actually insects and that we have compound eyes and peer into the healthcare system from a number of different dimensions. So in the ecosystem maps, which work most effectively, we've got 10 ways of peering into it, peering into it from the perspective of patients, patient pathways, patient geography, from the service team and how they're organized from the point of view of services and facilities, from the point of view of how the service team interacts with other people, from the point of view of education and training, from the point of view of the wider network and sources of innovation, from the point of view of policy at a local level, Tayside's policy and Scottish government policy. And um, insects have interesting eyes. In some ways, they are in insects are clearly not terribly intelligent creatures, but one thing about their eyes is that they can see extremely wide, much wider than a human eye, and they're very, very good at detecting sudden movements. So in a sense, peering into the ecosystem from the perspective of an insect is quite a useful way of doing it. You see wide and you can see th where things are changing very, very quickly. So with that um, basic canvas in the background, this is what the pharmacy services team looks like um, in Tayside when you map it out more systematically against that backdrop. We've now created a map which captures everything that's going on within pharmacy services. So these maps are now created using Miru, which is a tool that you can use within Teams and Zoom. It takes about, uh, with a good facilitator, it takes two 60 minute sessions with the team to actually build the map um, with some work going on in the background, obviously. And once you've got the map, you can bring it back to the team and use it for all sorts of different purposes. So this is where we've been using it to, with the team to say, right, what's gonna be driving change in your ecosystem over the next 18 months. So it's a way for the whole team to begin to have that conversation about what's driving change right across the, uh, the, the piece, as it were. And some people know a lot about policy change. Some people know a lot about what's going on with, in the minds of patients. Some people know an awful lot what's going on within the service team. So it's a way of bringing all of those insights together. So that's the map for pharmacy services. And um, this is a similar map. Uh, this is the one that's been just been done for emergency medicine in Tayside just done emergency medicine for NHS Lanarkshire and again there's the the geography at the top there's the patient pathways um, and so on and emergency medicine are going through the same process what will emergency medicine look like in six months time when we enter the winter and the pressure on the emergency medical teams and what will it look like in 12 months time as we come out of winter 21-22 and potentially we've been through another kind of Covid blip so it's a useful way for them to speculate on what the future looks like. Okay, so all of that's in the world of healthcare. What's that earth has that got to do with manufacturing production, you might ask, all very interesting. But one of the things that's come out of this is the, uh, the methodology. The methodology seems to be uh, an interesting one for mapping all sorts of different uh, ecosystems. So another piece of work that I've been involved with over the last couple of months has been with Glasgow City Council, looking at how the city deals with place planning. And again, using the, uh, the same framework, we've looked at people, places, protagonists. So they're all the people inside the system who design and commission places. And there's a massive policy framework that comes with uh, place planning. And uh, we've constructed an ecosystem map. It's very simple in a way, but it shows the connections between people who experience the city of Glasgow as an everyday place, the physical places, the work of the actors and the role of policy. And you can bring groups of people together to do exactly the same thing. Look at what are the drivers of change across this ecosystem over the next period of time. And with the very latest piece of work, we're looking at uh, whether you can actually spin the methodology back into the context of business. So this is a piece of work that I've just started with a, a green energy business or a business that um, is uh, associated with uh, wind turbines, very rapidly changing uh, business model. 
uh, where there's all sorts of opportunities for uh, data-driven decision-making. And they've constructed a very basic map. This is the kind of canvas they're using. Instead of talking about patients, they're talking about customers, not patient pathways, but customer pathways, customer geography. There's the team within the business, the services and facilities they have, how they interact with other businesses, massive um, piece to do with recruitment and staff and training in their business, the wider networks, whether they get their innovation from, and there's an awful lot happening within policy. And all of this is set within a shifting marketplace. So we're using the ecosystem maps to come up with a number of probably three or four different maps to look at three or four different scenarios. And what would they mean for the business? But it's a way of kind of mapping out uh, collaboratively with the team what the impact is uh, with a, this kind of mental model of what the business looks like. And you can see the kind of impact on customers and relate it to um, some other kind of square within the, uh, the ecosystem map. Okay, so that's my presentation. I've kind of taken us on a journey, um, reflected on what healthcare has learned from uh, manufacturing and production over the years, and just kind of wanted to flag up the way that, in a sense, the thinking is going out the way now, rather than drilling down and focusing in on very, very specific issues. There's now a massive need to think more holistically, get in the helicopter, peer down on the system, understand how the system works in order to really help navigate through this new world as we kind of all pivot and recover from COVID. This is a simple tool that's been developed to uh, help that process. And it's kind of being rolled out in um, Tayside and is beginning to be rolled out within other boards. But the interesting thing about this is how you can then apply it into other sectors. Because whatever sector you're in, you live in an ecosystem. And really, if you want to kind of innovate, you need to understand the ecosystem that you're in. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll just leave you with one question. Can you visualize your ecosystem? So um, if you're interested in that, that's something I'd be very interested in chatting to you about. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to come off screen share now and I'm going to hand over to uh, Jenny. Right. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, that's good, Chin. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, let me change this more around. So, so my name is Yi Chin. I'm professor in manufacturing technology and the systems. So I'm also the director of the Center for Precision Manufacturing in the department the DMEM. And I'm going to talk about the project specifically today. For this project, I have the five research assistants that work with me, so I list here. But I also work with the company called Pasco Engineering uh, just outside Glasgow. So actually, we have been working with Pasco Engineering for more than 25 years now. So we know each other uh, very well. So the, let's go uh, through this one. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce our Center for Precision Manufacturing. We actually, we actually work closely with AMS and we support AMS by providing some uh, specialists in the manufacturing technology, such as the precision uh, forming and micro nano manufacturing, ultra precision machining, and also ultra fine grain metals and multi scale modeling. So we do a lot of different things. So through the years, we have been, we have been very successful in terms of securing the external funding. So I list some recent and current project here. So I don't want to go through detail. Uh, what I want to see is the next slide is we actually very proactive or active and in work with the industries. So for example, from the project I list here, you can see that we have a lot of the industrial companies working with us. Uh, one of the biggest projects we have been coordinating, we coordinate in the past, it's called uh, Mass Micro Project. In that project, we have 36 partners, but importantly, we have 19 industrial companies. In the last project list here, it's called the Fast Smart Project, which I'm coordinate uh, is also a European project. We have the 14 project partners but I have the eight industrial companies. So we are very active uh, work with industry. Come back to this uh, project. 
Uh, we talk about engine molding and also repurpose re and it's upgrading the production lines. So why we do that? Because if you know uh, engine molding, you probably know that engine molding is one of the most popular used uh, processes for produce plastic components or parts. Uh, some people said that 60% uh, of the plastic uh, parts uh, components probably made by engine molding. But if you want to fast reconfigure, like repurpose those production line for alternative products, sometimes you do have the problems. So such as the, you take a long time actually and negotiate with designer in terms of how you actually fix your product design before we actually can fix the mode design, for example. So that because sometimes mode design also very rigid, you can change that. If you want to change the parts, you have to change whole things. And also they take a long time to set up a new production line. And also there's some issue about the make the modes take a long time. So one of the major concerns actually for me is that we actually lost a lot of the skills and specialists or capacity in terms of make the modes in this country. It's because people intend to buy a lot of things now. We think, we think that most people think it's cheaper to buy them actually rather than actually make by ourselves. The problem is that is once the supply chain is actually broken down, then you can't buy them, you can't get those parts. So that's our problem uh, we face. So the, based on the problems we identified, we work with closely with the uh, University of the Technology uh, in Athens, for example. We developed this proposal uh, called the Impure uh, project and focused on engine molding repurposing for medical supplies. This was the uh, response to a special uh, call from European Commission uh, in relation to the uh, COVID-19. So it's new funding actually set up. In this project, we have the 19 project uh, partners, including the uh, 13 industrial companies in this project. So what we want to do with this project, uh, actually it's a big budget uh, uh, right here, uh, 7.3 million euros, uh, but we have to spend that in, within the 18 months. Because this is the first, let's say, uh, track and it's a faster response uh, type of the project. So what we want to do with this uh, project, we want to reorientate the or repurpose uh, some engine uh, pro uh, molding production lines. As we said, that was six actually engine molding companies involved in this project. And we want to look at the, how we can actually fast, let's say, repurpose or remake some new modes, for example, uh, once when the products have been changed. And then we want to put some kind of new let's concept like interchangeable uh, mode insert for swift change. But also we trace some kind of the manufacturing activity like they use, use additive manufacturing to make the mode insert uh, target fast uh, turnaround, let's say within uh, two or three days, something like that. But also we also look at the IT landscape infrastructure in the SME especially how we can use advanced tools to help company to respond quickly and to the events like COVID-19. So this is actually like whole package to upgrade or repurpose production lines. So what do we do in terms of Strasglide is a rule. We focus on the first look at the problems area at bottom legs, what are the problems in current production lines? As I said, that is not about only about the past engineering, but also other companies involved in this project. We also look at the design of these uh, medical supply comp components for them, how we can simplify or re redesign those components in order to reduce the sub and its manufacturing chains and the number of the processes involved. And also they look at the, let's say, actually upgrade a real production line to demonstrate the capabilities. Then, at the same time, we look at the how we can make the modes and quickly. So we use additive manufacturing, for example. Uh, so first thing we look at the uh, whole production line, for example, look at the uh, facility across the, the six companies. And uh, we identify some problems like the uh, state of the machinery. Uh, some mach machinery is too old, don't have the, any you know, advanced controller, don't access to the don't have access to the data, for example, it's no condition monitoring, real condition kind of monitoring. And uh, so what you can do with those kind of facilities. The problem is that with uh, small companies, 
you can't buy a machine, continue buying just using new machines, it's impossible. Sometimes you have to keep a machine for 20 or 30 years. So what we can do with this kind of older machines in order to benefit from the advanced technology or systems. So this is the, uh, another thing is about the, as I said, it's about the made, make the modes and uh, sometimes the time consuming. So we can, how we can speed up this kind of process. So we look at the whole production line, we proposed uh, to upgrade production, production line by let's say, um, improve the condition monitoring, especially, and especially for the old machine and the old production line. We add low particular handling to the production line you know, in order to incre increase the efficiency. But also we going to install some uh, MES system, for example, by connecting those MES to the old systems. Sometimes you can buy an MES system. The problem is that those that MES system normally is uh, specific for some uh, controller, advanced controller, like a like controller, for example. But if your machine is too old, you don't have this kind of controller, uh, it's difficult to connect. So how we connect, create interfaces, and also we look at how we connect this, um, let's say, a system like the um, MES to the ERP and also even a custom customer relationship management system. So there's a lot of the work to be done in terms of connection with software. And for example, we de develop the new API, for example, to connect this software. So we work out the strategy to upgrade this production line and look at the uh, typical medical supply components or products and started the design of, um, features and the manufacturing requirement and work out a strategy in parallel fashions, uh, how we actually address those. Let's say start from the upgrade machines, upgrade the equipment, and also they look at the let's say, handling systems, the sensors, uh, and all your data acquisition systems, and also then look at the mode make itself. So then we integrate those together. So we start some kind of trials for in six or seven months time. So eventually we demonstrate some typical uh, medical uh, components of manufacturing and uh, for some uh, this company, which are not probably uh, specifically or specialized in the medical suppliers uh, manufacturing. So the, this is the, what uh, actually going on right now in terms of our work in this project. So we already examined the state of the machinery and we'll work out a strategy where we add the sensors, for example, like screw position transducers and hydraulic pressure sensors in the modern machines and even some cavity sensors, for example. And then we look at the, how we capture and uh, which kind of data acquisition system we can use use our own system or use, uh, let's say, commercial, uh, commercial available system, use standard interface like the OPC UA uh, the data format, for example, used for connected uh, sensor to the uh, data acquisition systems. But also the, what we want to do in this project, we want to not only look at just the MES or the manufacturing machine itself, we also want to connect this to the ERP system and even the cloud manufacturing uh, system. In our project, we have the partner actually also based on Glasgow. They let's have the software like iScan, for example, which can be used with identify that can be used for cloud manufacturing, for example. So then in that way, can, let's say machine can be, uh, manufacturing can be monitored on site or remotely. So that's also the good for let's say 24 hours production, for example and um, to be let's say managed by this small company. And in the robotic handling, once we let's say uh, simplify some design, we found that we need actually, let's say, put some of the mode insert into the uh, machines. Um, but sometimes the company do rely on the, the let's say operator to do that, but that's very, very unsafe obviously and low efficiency as well. So what we want to do in this project is put the robotic handling in, the, in that production lines. So we already actually uh, have the robots and uh, let's say in the uni and also we program that. We also design new and let's say grippers and then we and try that in the past engineering in a couple of months. 
But then also they, as I said that, we also the redesigned the oximeter, but this is a specialist oximeter not used for the, let's say, uh, normal custom, but for the specialist like hospital use oximeter. And we redesigned that. We simplify the design, reduce the number of parts, for example, from the probably nine parts to the three parts, for example, but they involve the overmoding as well. And also use the ceramic, uh, let's say, insert to protect electronics. We want to try that concept. And so then they also they work on the concept called modular design. So in the modular design, which means that we separate the mode insert from the master mode, and also the cooling will be separate as well. And there are some connections how we actually change that. So once the uh, let's say you have the uh, demand for new product, you design new mode insert, and then uh, without changing must modes, and also just need to uh, change is the mode insert. So that's what we're doing right now. But also, as I said, that for speed up the mode make, we we ever know that additive manufacturing can do a lot of things for this. But the problem is that they, sometimes the process setting up and uh, use the let's say best uh, combination of the parameters. It's sometimes a still challenge, especially the quality of the parts you print and use some kind of additive manufacturing facilities. So what we will do with this in this project is to, based on our experience in the past project, we built a lot of the models for different kinds of additive manufacturing based on our, uh, let's say, uh, simulations. And for example, use this kind of the uh, safety uh, simulation combined with the final element simulations. So we can simulate a lot of things but we build, it's a business simulations, we build some kind of the model base or like database. And then in the future, people can quickly use this kind of information results. But in the future, we also add some kind of like data, uh, machine learning and data mining into the system. So then people can quickly use some data models to set up a new process uh, for new, let's say, mode, uh, mode insert to be made by additive manufacturing. So the, this is the, uh, what I want uh, to uh, in terms of the uh, technology and the process itself. So uh, quickly, to a quick conclusions. So the, there's a lot of actually factors uh, which could influence the, how quickly a company, especially a small company can responded to the requirement, especially if there is some kind of urgent and it's the uh, demand like the, uh, the dealing with uh, COVID-19, for example. We believe that to address those kind of problems, we need to look at the overall pictures as our colleague and already said that about the next supply chain, for example, uh, you need to look at the whole things. Uh, for in, from technology point of view, we need to look at the integrated solutions, not only look at sensors, single machines or controller, or we need to look at the IT, production IT, landscape or infrastructure in the, within the companies and how actually work is connected directly to the customers, interact with customers as well. So through this, I work with this company, company for example, in this project, like for us, as uh, not four large company and uh, nine SMEs, uh, we, we should be able to demonstrate these capabilities and hopefully we can help the company and uh, to achieve some kind of capability and uh, help them to uh, respond to the COVID-19 or other similar events quicker. So that's my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. So now I can stop sharing or hand over to Chris. Okay. That's me. Chris? We lost Chris. <laughs> What's that? I can't, I can't see Chris, so um, will I will I carry on? I think at this point, um, the idea was um, 
to have questions for any of the speakers. So if anybody um, has a question, you can either put it in the Q&A um, or chat functions, or um, if you want to ask directly, I'm sure we can enable that. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's true. No, it's not. Yeah, that's good. Chris, I'm just well, I'm just asking people if they've got any questions. Now is possibly the time to ask. Sorry, sorry, that's terrible. I had um, you probably noticed my internet just totally went. So I do apologise. It was the most inop an opportune moment. I'm actually tethered through my own personal phone at this moment in time, so there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Our chronic problems. But um, sorry, Gillian, where have we got to in the proceedings? So uh, Chin just finished his presentation and I was inviting people to ask questions through the chat or Q&A. Uh, okay, okay, that's, that's fine. Okay, have we had any takers yet, Jill, or I can field a few? Not that I can see. Okay, so, so in, in terms of this part of the session, then we'll just have a bit of a brief Q&A from the presentations, Gillian, then, and we'll, we'll go from there in terms of the panellist session. But um, I guess first question to yourself, Jill, about your the survey results. What were the key surprises from what you'd um, actually, you know, kind of witnessed? Well, as I said in the presentation, I think when we just when we thought we should go and look at this, what how how the uh, pandemic has affected manufacturing. I think in my head at that point, I was seeing lots of job losses. I expected to see lots of companies folding. I was expecting to see supply chains crumbling. And in reality, we never really saw that in our, our study. Yes, there's been pockets, but not on the scale that we were kind of expecting. Um, and I guess the other thing that you know I wasn't expecting was just how many positives there were. Um, and you know, people that are actually taking this an as an opportunity to rethink their businesses, and you know, the kind of things that Tom was talking about, people actually thinking about their business models going forward, um, was a positive for me. What worries you most, though, Jill, Jill, about what you witnessed? Oh, I think a couple of things. I think the I think the talent bit is a worry. Um, you know, so I do uh, think yeah. that we we have lost people in manufacturing and. Um, that's perhaps skills that are hard to replace. I think I'm worried about the kind of um, the kind of pause on apprenticeships, um, and also you know the the graduate jobs. Um, you know, there's a lot there's, there's a lot of uncertainty there. So I think the I think the talent worries me, and I think probably also this kind of um, with people talking about reshoring, um, and lots of people do see that as a positive. But for me, I think when I'm looking at certain sectors, you know, the, the automotive, the aerospace in particular, um, you know, a lot of the, the companies are, are, are overseas owned and headquartered. And a lot of what they're buying isn't, um, isn't from the UK. So I'm actually talking to the Fraser of Allender just now about trying to get some help from um, economists to help us actually dig down a wee bit deeper into that and look at, you know, exactly what is being bought in the UK and um, you know what are the real risks. So go, going forward, the next stage in our project, we're actually doing some scenario building um, for what is manufacturing going to look like in Scotland in 20 years time, um, given the information we know just now. So, so that's the next phase of our project. And if anybody's interested in that, you're, you're very welcome to get in touch and get involved. Um, but yeah, quite excited about that. Thank you, Joe, for those additional insights. Just time for one more, I think, on, on this particular aspect. But I guess, Tom, maybe a question for yourself around what do you think the manufacturing community could learn from what you've developed there, particularly around the ecosystem, uh, the mapping and the, and, the, and the canvas that's been developed? I think the, um, the uh, I think for any sector, actually, that the whole issue of understanding your ecosystem is a really uh, key issue because we all live increasingly, as Jill's been uh, alluding to, within these kind of complex networks of supply chain customers and so on, where there's an awful lot of change happening. And um, we also work within teams within, within our organizations. And there's probably very few people who have very complete oversight of all of that. So these kind of maps are just a way of um, pooling that understanding and bringing everybody together. So you can almost kind of create a Polaroid snapshot for a moment in time. And it might be now, 
or it might be about taking, a, as, as Jill was saying, a kind of snapshot into the future, what things might look like in 10 years time or 20 years time. And so it's just a kind of, they're an opportunity to think in a slightly different way about your business. Um, obviously, you know, 99% of the time is going to be consumed in kind of the, the here and now and the operational challenges of the here and now. But this is a way of uh, stepping back from that and uh, looking more holistically at what's going on. And I think that's what the ecosystem maps are providing within the healthcare system. And um, I think there's probably a role for them in, in other sectors. As I say, I've been working with one or two companies now who are very interested in this as they try and kind of make sense of what's happening next for them in terms of the market and so on. Thank you very much, Sam. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for the presentations, guys. Very much appreciate it. So we'll, we'll pass on to the panellist part of the session now, if that's okay, everyone. So I guess, Chin, Tom and Gillian, would you like to turn your cameras off, if that's okay? Hopefully my bandwidth is holding out here. So I, I'm, I'm, I, what I'd like to do is um, just introduce our panellists. I do thank you all for being online today and uh, very much appreciate the support there. So first up, we've got Stuart Strachan. So hi, Stuart, how you doing? I'm well, thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks very much for, for the opportunity to take part in the panel today. My, my pleasure. So just, just briefly, Stuart, you, you're head of the advanced manufacturing at the Scottish Government and since September 2018. I, I, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that's right. So in, in the last year, I've uh, specifically been involved in uh, a number of programmes designed to try and help the, the manufacturing sector, particularly the manufacturing recovery plan that you've already covered. Um, and my uh, team were also yeah. responsible for the guidance for the manufacturing sector. Um, which was obviously pulled together um, fa fairly quickly with, with the support of the sector and we've been working with them ever since in terms of refining it and, uh, and trying to draw some lessons from that. Thank you very much. Stuart. Welcome. Tim, Tim Bithson. How are you doing, Tim? Hope you're well. Hi there, yes. Yes, thanks for, for, for having us on today, yeah, Chris. My, my pleasure. So you're, you're the Applications Director at Bitslist. Tim, That's you right, quick, yes. Uh, just a quick few lines on that, that'd be great. So we, uh, we're both a manufacturing company and uh, we develop software for manufacturing environments. Um, we're working on integrated uh, PLM, ERP, MES uh, and customer relations management software. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Welcome. Uh, we've got Alan. Hello, Alan Aubrey. How are you doing? Hi, Chris. Yeah, great presentations today. Really, really insightful. Yeah, totally enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you very much, Alan. So you're Chief Technologist for Siemens, particularly around the Digital Industries Division, Alan. Would you like to just give a quick overview? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have heard of Siemens, I guess, but uh, global organisation. Um, in the UK, we, we both provide technology, so automation, machining, CNCs and software technology, and we also manufacture in the UK. So we've got 16 manufacturing facilities, quite diverse. Um, from uh, subsea connectors to trains to wind turbines. Um, and the, the one that I spend a lot of my time mostly in is uh, our factory in Congleton, where we manufacture variable speed drives for the world market. Um, but yeah, very, very diverse. And one of the great things about that is the fact that we've been quite successful throughout lockdown because, we, because of our diversity, basically. Interesting. I look forward to hearing a bit about that later on. So thank you very much and welcome. Uh, Sam Turner. So Sam is the CTO for the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult. Hi, Sam. How are you doing? Hi, Chris. Well, thank you. It's been a great uh, set of presentations. Yeah, good, great to see the response, the, well, the average response to COVID. I said it more about what the cost of the catapult. So yeah, I'm looking at cost of seven HVM catapult sets, including MS. Thank you very much, Sam, and welcome. And last but not least, Stuart McKinley, our very own Stuart McKinley. How are you doing, Stuart? I'm fine, Chris. Thank you. And I uh, thoroughly enjoyed the presentations today. Very informative. Thank you. So Stuart's the NMIS Manufacturing Skills Academy uh, Director. So welcome, Stuart. Well, welcome to you all. I think if I introduced everyone, I think I have, yes. So welcome, everyone, to the, the panellist session. We, we've got about half an hour, 35 minutes, just to have a... A quick exploration as it were of key kind of insights that have come up today and insights from your particular world uh, as well so i guess question to stuart uh, strachan at scottish government so 
uh, would you be able to com make a comment really, Stuart, on the potential kind of observations from the manufacturing sector's COVID compliance record in Scotland? It's been a really challenging environment and space. So how have companies really operated in that environment and how, what's their record today kind of thing? And any insights you've got, of course, about what comes next? Sure, yeah. Well, um, I, I guess overall I would, whilst without, uh, uh, you know, underselling the, the sort of significant issues that there's been for certain manufacturers and certain sectors, I would kind of echo some of the kind of positive comments that Gillian's made about the way that the sectors responded and, uh, you know, the, the, the impact maybe hasn't been as severe as, as we, we might have expected at the outset of all of this. Um, so just, just to give you an insight in terms of compliance, it's obviously something we, we keep a very close eye on and that's all structured within that overall strategic framework that the Scottish Government manages. And it's worth noting that within that strategic framework, manufacturing is operational at all levels. So that wasn't that wasn't necessarily, you know, going to be the, the case or, or, or it, it needn't have been the case. Um, but the manufacturing sector itself really demonstrated an excellent compliance record and that really contributed to, to the decision to have manufacturing keep operating as well as obviously all the essential uh, elements that certain manufacturers produce. So just to give you an, a, an, an insight into that, there's, there's been about, uh, we, we work very closely with HSE on the data that they, they run and uh, there's been over 5,000 checks on the manufacturing sector um, from, from the outset of this. This is until the end of April, so there'll be, there'll be even more done now. Um, roughly 50-50 are site visits and others are remote visits. Um, and um, uh, the vast, vast majority of those require no further action. So um, over 4,500 of those required no further action. Um, where there was further action, the vast majority was just verbal advice. And I think the most striking statistic is that um, out of uh, you know, a full year, um, there were just nine enforcement issues, uh, enforcement notices issued to the manufacturing sector, um, and, and only two out with the food processing sector, because um, for the purposes of manufacturing statistics, um, um, food processing is captured within those, those SIP codes. So I think that that in itself is is, a, is is really striking and really remarkable, actually. Um, and and personally, for me, and and working with the sector throughout this crisis, my experience has really been one of working with a cult with a, a sector whose culture was suited to, you know, adaptation in those circumstances. Um, and that that that's that's been really striking. It's not been easy by any stretch of the imagination and, and no one would claim it has been. But um, I think you, what I, my experience has been of working with a really pragmatic and detailed approach within the working group for, for that guidance. Um, and it's, it's led to what I think is some real, real lessons for some of the other sectors. So manufacturing guidance was one of the very first pieces of guidance that the Scottish government published for sectors. Um, some of you might be aware that there's a very, very yes, wide range piece, of guidance. Piece, yeah. yeah, very, very wide uh, guidance um, available now for all range of sectors. But really, um, a lot of the, them drew on the lessons that we drew ourselves from the manufacturing sector in terms of pulling it all together. So I think, I think you know, in, in, in overall terms, um, like I say, whilst it's been the most difficult year for many on record for understandable reasons, I think there's, there is a... a a sort of feel, feeling of some optimism kind of going forward in terms of the way the resilience that the, the sectors had and and, and and in my view some some lessons for the sec for other sectors um the, the other sort of comment i would make is just uh, in terms of the um the, the lessons from some of the uh, demographics of the sector as well. And, and on that, I would kind of uh, uh, support some of Gillian's points too. I think we're, we're very conscious that manufacturing is an aging sector and it's a male dominated sector. And that is something that I think, uh, you know, when, when you take account the, the, the risk factors associated with COVID and who were in the high risk groups, you know, um, prior to the vaccination process, you know, that in itself was a consideration, you know, uh, for, for, for us moving forward. So I think the, the overall thrust of Scottish Government's inclusiveness and sector attractiveness to try and attract more, more people, particularly females, in, into the sector um, and, and more ethnic minorities as well would be a really kind of welcome 
sort of targeted approach that, that we'd be looking to work with the sector moving forward with um, uh, after this crisis. So I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there and, and allow anyone else to come in. Thank you for those insights, Stuart. That's, that's excellent. Were there, were, were there any particular sort of, just, just one further point on any um, sort of uh, suggestions that come out of the working groups, any guidance, key features? Uh, well, some of the key features, it's, 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 nothing, it's nothing that's going to um, come as a particular shock to any, anyone in this call who works closely with the manufacturing sector, but a little, a little feature like you know, an operational checklist um, and, and the, the features that were on that operational checklist, that's, that's a key part of our manufacturing guidance, clearly. We were the first sectoral guidance team, as far as I'm aware, to, to produce one of those, um, because as I say, we're one of the early adopters. And really what, what I've seen is colleagues involved in producing other sectoral guidance uh, material sweeping in behind that approach and, and really utilizing it for sectors such as retail, hospitality, uh, other sectors that might not have that kind of hierarchy of control methodology at the heart of what they do in the way that the, that the, that the manufacturing sector does and, and being able to adopt you know some some real lessons some real resilience lessons from from manufacturing um kind of moving forward would would they recognize that explicitly probably not and actually i think there's maybe something that that says about um how we could articulate the the, the incredible working culture within the manufacturing sector in a way that might attract other people to the sector in, in that way and really talk about the achievements in the manufacturing sector um, in, a, in a way that really makes it um, a, a more attractive sector to some of those groups that might not instinctively look towards manufacturing as, as a career moving forward. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Stuart. I'll, I'll, I'll move on then swiftly to Tim a bits list. Uh, so Tim, you're a, you run an SME in the Glasgow region. So I'd just like to understand firsthand, as it were, Tim, what the direct impacts that COVID has had upon your business and what, what were the immediate kind of challenges you faced and how you really responded during and, and ongoing, of course. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Well, um, like any uh, manufacturing business locally, we've uh, really been fortunate to have been able to carry on operations over the period. Um, it's probably been the first time for many years I can say it's a good sector to be in. <laughs> Certainly haven't had the uh, the horrors of working from home for uh, the entire time, like my poor wife who's in the financial sector has, etc. Um, we were quite able to uh, um, take up on social distancing, etc. at the factory, and it's only been office staff that have been remote working. Some of those office uh, staff have been able to get onto site when required. Um, so it's been a bit more, uh, there's been a bit more variety, a bit more going on than there might be in other sectors. So we have to be grateful for that first off, I think. Um, we have had to make use of the, uh, the, the furlough scheme. Um, we didn't initially anticipate just how bad the supply chains would be affected, um, but we've had multiple ends. You know, we've had uh, products going to client on site. These sites, uh, our products go all over the world and we don't know what's going to happen in any given region at any given time. It's not based on the UK response, it's based on a, a global response, what site's going to be open for us to deliver and commission a product, product to, for example. So a lot of product is also paid, ship at dock, you know, free at dock. So uh, where customers haven't required them, they've also not required to, to have had to pay for them. So we've had cash constraints based on that. Orders, uh, they may be coming in or they may not, depending on whether offices, et cetera, are open at uh, customers projects have been put on hold and then of course we've got this incredible uh, metal price fluctuation at the moment that's causing havoc for orders that we've um, quoted a year ago steel prices up at nearly twofold what they were a year ago where if you're making structural items like cranes is a large part of your operation is in the steel price and, and burnout plates then again with uh, local supply issues liberty etc you'll have seen in the news uh, the steel industry is giving us some concern at the moment. Um, <clears throat> but uh, other than that, the physical changing of the site to cope with COVID has been relatively straightforward. The guidance was good. There was a little bit of disarray at the beginning for the first couple of months where we got our heads around what we were and weren't allowed to do. But I think that was to be expected. And I think overall, you know, manufacturing uh, without taking into consideration the 
things out of our control in supply chain and customer requirements. We have been lucky to have continued operations and the government support's been very good. You know, the, the furlough scheme, a lot of things would not have been possible without the furlough scheme for us. Yeah. Brilliant insights there. So you explored several areas. I guess it's uh, one thing after another, isn't it? You look at the uh, commodity prices as well. The, the, the inflation associated with them is substantial at this moment of time. So it's, it's a really challenging environment then for, in, in summary, Tim, and it continues to, to be so. Um, I, I guess in terms of that funding landscape, is there anything that you, you mentioned furlough was important to your business. Is there anything else required going forward, not just on the furlough side of things, but in terms of maybe innovation as well, or other opportunities to help support your business? Is, is there anything that, that, that could be of use to you guys? I think there has been, obviously, like everyone else, we've seen quite rapid uptick in uh, the use of uh, technology for online meetings and presentations and ideas uh, transferring between people like even in this forum here today. Um, but uh, I think one of the things we are recognising uh, and that we will want assistance with going forward is that while we all say that we've uh, adopted new technologies rapidly over this period of time, um, a great deal of what we've adopted has been things that have been provided by companies that either were working on technologies or foresaw this situation. And that what we've adopted has been off the shelf and provided for by foreign companies that were already ahead of the curve. And that if you look at the amount of innovation that we've done here in the UK, there's a lot to learn here now. We need to take stock of the technologies that we're using, take stock of the new methods and things that we think we've identified that are going to help going forward and understand them much better. Uh, a key thing for us is going to be around the fundamental skills inside our organisation associated with digital and not looking to adopt other people's programs and software as, uh, you know, that's it, that's how it's going to be done. We're going to wait for Microsoft to come up with the next best thing. We need to understand what we're using from the things that we've actually implemented now and understand what the cost benefit of using those things is. And there are obviously a whole heap load of things that are going to be applicable to other challenges that we know are on the horizon that could cause pressures as intense as COVID, such as climate change or even cyber attack. And that we need to understand the technologies that we're putting in place. And we need to understand the other benefits of these technologies, reduction in environmental impact, the reduction of costs and wastes in the business and the reduction of risks of accidents, which, you know, is another thing for not having so much transportation going on, for example, or for having fewer people on site in any in any place. You know, our, our accident and near miss race is obviously much lower than it was before. You know, we tried to keep it low. But hey, look, if you keep people apart from each other and you keep working environments safe and uncluttered and you keep people working from home, you're reducing risks as well. So there are a lot of benefits there. But we are worried that we don't actually know how to implement some of these things ourselves from fundamental principles. Manufacturing engineering needs to become digital, not in the adapt adaptation of technologies from overseas, but in our own self-sufficient understanding of how we go about implementing computer technologies. There's been a huge gap, I think, in the education system where we have not been able to train computer programmers and we haven't been able to bring computer programmers into the manufacturing environment. And I think that is my biggest concern at the moment is that the changes that we're making very rapidly are not underpinned by fundamental understanding in the workforce. Brilliant. So that's some excellent, really excellent insights there. We can obviously help maybe get some time to divert those a bit later or maybe offline Tim, because there's a lot, lot to go out there. I mean, using that as a bit of a segue into Alan Norbury at Siemens, obviously from a global presence, which Siemens has, Alan, in many OEMs and SMEs, what have you um, witnessed really with the main kind of challenges due to COVID? Is there, is there any observations you can build upon, particularly from what Tim's been saying? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, I think there's a lot of similarities. Uh, I think in the early days, um, sort of March to April 2020, uh, there was no clarity from the government, uh, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and we didn't really know what to do. So what, what we did was made a number of autocratic decisions, which we wouldn't normally have done. Um, and then gain feedback very quickly from anybody that those decisions impacted on and then made adjustments rapidly. Um, and then later on, after April, when uh, guide, guidelines were, were given from the government, um, we found then we had a reduction of staff on the shop floor because we had to continue manufacturing a lot of our products, you know, are used in all different sectors. So we continued manufacturing. 
Um, so we actually got to a point where there was about 70 people off um, from the shop floor due to shielding or childcare or various different reasons. So what we did to, to bridge the gap was we brought in white collar workers. So people from the office environment were working on the shop floor, which is just quite interesting, as you can imagine. Um, we also made the decision to reduce our capacity to 80 percent. Um, and, and also we had to ensure that we had a you know, stock of components uh, from our supply chain, which was another challenge. Um, one of the great things, actually, one positive uh, about Brexit is the fact that we had stock allocated for Brexit, which actually bridged the gap, you know, that 80 percent to 100 percent, um, which we actually used to, to solve the problem of uh, during lockdown. So uh, there is a positive side to Brexit. Um, I think one of the things we, we found is that... We, we, might to, we might have to know that one, Alan. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> we'll have to know that one in terms of the positive side of that. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 Sorry the, to interrupt. That might be the only one, I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, we also found that it's really important that we protect our workers, so we have to allocate safe working space. Um, there's a lot of disruption. We talk about disruption from a manufacturing and technology perspective, but also there's a cultural dis disruption as well. So attitude to change uh, was quite interesting because in the past, when, when change happens, people sometimes resist it, but there was a very good reason for change. So then people started to embrace it, partly through fear, but also emotional change as well. Uh, we also found that uh, home working men, that our IT people um, really had to, had to come up to scratch and they were absolutely brilliant. I had one occasion where my PC failed completely and next day I got a PC pre-built, ready to go. Within, I don't know, a couple of hours, I was up and running. Um, so yeah, hats off to our IT people globally. Um, and, then, and then I think one of the biggest challenges we have more recently is supply chain. There's certain components that we have to bring in from abroad, purely because we don't manufacture them in the UK, which is a, another subject which I'll get onto later on. Um, and also with Brexit, so we have a lot of products stuck in customs, um, which means the certain uh, products are products that weren't stopped for Brexit, we, we can't supply quickly. And that's impacting on our customers' manufacturing capabilities globally. So, uh, yeah, a lot to learn. Um, and there's a lot of our seamless technologies that we've used to solve a lot of those problems, which uh, I guess we'll come on to. Thank you for those insights, Alan. In terms of your interaction with industry, the businesses you deal with, you've seen, going back to what Tim was saying about this digital, the new digital world, or maybe it's more, you know, kind of substantial now in terms of where, where we're going. Have you noticed that as a trend within the companies you're dealing with? Are they more willing to embrace these tools and look at new um, ways of innovating around digital tech? Uh, in some cases, I think it's a case of wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> you know, that, that actually the, the some organisations that have embraced digital technologies over many years, um, others have kind of resisted against it. But now all of a sudden we, we're starting to realise actually things like, for example, remote access into machinery, is becoming quite important, especially during lockdown. I think things like this, you know, Zoom and, and digital tools for, for web conferences are becoming absolutely essential. Um, so I think attitudes have changed. Uh, one of the biggest challenges around the use of digital technologies is skills. Um, and that doesn't happen overnight. Um, I mean, the way that we use uh, the digital twin, I'll use the term digital twin, for virtualizing uh, our, our products, our, our machinery, our processes and our people um, in our factory and colleges has taken many years. It's taken seven or eight years to build up the skills to be able to use the tool, um, but also change the culture to be able to embrace it. Um, there's, there's absolutely no point in trying to force new technologies onto people if they resist against it um, and I think the change in culture again you have to be very careful in the way that you do that um, I mean for example when we build an assembly cell for uh, manufacture assembling some of our components in the past we use cardboard to simulate the the environment tactile you can touch it you can see it you can feel it we we wanted to move towards using the virtual reality cave so virtual environment and there was a cultural change. So what we did, we got to the point where we had both, we had cardboard and the virtual reality cave. 
to show actually you can change things a lot quickly in the virtual reality cave and it works just as well as the cardboard, but we can do it a lot quicker. Uh, now we don't use cardboard anymore, everything's done virtually in the, the virtual reality cave. That takes time, you can't force it on people and, and you have to get acceptance. Thank you, Alan, some really good insights there. And I guess you, you, using the skills piece to move over to my colleague, Stuart McKinley. So Stuart, uh, welcome, of course. And um, the skills have been mentioned a lot about in terms of how they supported in the immediate aftermath, as it were, but long-term as well. So what would be your insights about how uh, the skills agenda has changed due to the pandemic and what, what we need to do next, as it were, to make sure that uh, these new innovations, as it were, actually stick within the workforce and and it's been commented upon, you know, how we take that further, how we innovate around that. Thanks, Chris. And, and again, I think there's been some really useful insights from, from colleagues around the table. It has, of course, been a, a time of immense turbulence in the skills uh, ecosystem and the skills uh, sector. And it really has reinforced the imperative of us all working together. I'll, I'll just throw some numbers at you to give you an indication, you know, um, engineering modern apprenticeship registrations in Scotland probably about 40% down last year. Um, Scottish Power graduate applications up over 40% this year. And if you look at job sites like Euro Brussels, over 40% of those jobs are now mentioning digital and low carbon. So we are seeing you know, a shift in the, the landscape and the introduction of the need for new skills in, in digital manufacturing, supporting net zero and the green jobs. I think increasingly, and, and Tim and others have touched on it, you know, that move to online learning has seen many benefits, um, including some short-term productivity gains. But I think there's a recognition that there are some implications, particularly around about practical work, and those that haven't all been resolved. And there's also some evidence from America and from the, from the UK that pupils suffer more in online technical studies, such as maths, than they do in some of the softer skills. And of course, we do have, as Jill touched on, the existing challenges or the previous challenges, such as the ageing workforce um, and extremely lean organisations. Um, and when we look at the data around about that, you know, it, it says that in the UK from the mid 40s, most people in, in the manufacturing sector stopped their formal education. Uh, and in SMEs, in many SMEs, people are only getting between 10 and 11 minutes of formal training uh, a week. So how, how do we you know, create an agile system that meets the needs of employers and individuals in that system, particularly against the backdrop where, and I know it's you know, one of the organisations that Siemens work with, you've got at one end of the spectrum people like Red Bull who are making 10,000 engineering changes a month. So how do we marry all those things up and, and make a system that um, works for that? I think increasingly we're recognising that um, industry 4.0 and, and net zero and, and green jobs it has to be a, a series of smaller steps, you know, particularly for many SMEs. Um, you know, sometimes the term industry 4.0 is just seen to be a bridge too far. And collectively, we need to be working through a journey that takes people on, a, on that kind of journey in smaller steps and bite-sized chunks, both for employers and for individuals. Thank you, Stuart. Some really good insights there, particularly the practical steps angle. I think that's really important in terms of what we've discussed today about how we um, create it at a level that's accessible for industry. So, you'd like you said, industry for what, what is it? And it's a real, could be a real comprehensive solution, as it were. But what are the actual practical steps on that journey? And what, what is right for your business? So, I think that's a real an interesting observation there. In terms of the skills academy, in terms of the development of the skills agenda there, it's, it's, it's gathering pace. I do know that, obviously working quite closely with you, but could you just give us an overview of how the Manufacturing Skills Academy within MS is, will help support this going forward? Surely, and, and thanks again, Chris. I think we, we are working right across the piece, you know, so we were involved in, in creating and developing the Digital Manufacturing Foundation Apprenticeship. I think, again, Tim touched about the education system and that's, you know, we are engaging with schools and, and pupils at schools as they start that part of their journey. We are supporting um, SMEs with free online content through the Advancing Manufacturing Challenge Funds. And I know, you know, your team's got one as well, Chris, under AMBATS. And um, we have the Online Digital Manufacturing Leadership, CPD. Uh, and part of that is kind of one-to-one -one um, sessions with SMEs to help them work out the next stages in their learning journeys and it complements the work that 
the likes of SMAS, et cetera, do. Um, of course, we've worked very closely with, with colleagues like Stuart, Scottish Government, Scottish Funding Council and Skills Development Scotland, uh, as part of the Manufacturing Recovery Plan. Um, and we've got a range of activities there currently, both for individuals. Um, interestingly, what we've found is that those kind of technical subjects for, for individuals are, are reasonably well taken up. Um, Sorry, I should have explained that NTTF is a National Transition Training Fund. That's for those who are 25 and over who are unemployed or at risk of redundancy. Um, so those technical subjects um, are reasonably well taken up by and large. Um, but some of the, the kind of key skills that people need to be more agile and adaptive going forward, such as you know, meta skills with West College Scotland, or managing organisational subcultures with David Fraser, and probably not seeing the demand there that we had anticipated and we've got some work there to do to connect with individuals. Um, I think in terms of employers, you know, we've worked with the photonic sector, which is worth a billion pounds a year and plus in Scotland. And we're actually standing up a course that gives people an entry level course to allow them to convert into the photonic sector, working with lasers. Um, and again, you know, Jill touched on the, the, the talent worries me part. Um, we, we do have provision and we have recruited um, towards 30 graduates who were working and give a, a six-month um, full-time job, some of those working with, with an NMIS, but others working with employers across the length and breadth of Scotland from the Cromarty Firth down to Kelso in, in many of the sectors we'd like them to be working in, you know, um, renewables and, and wind, etc. cetera. Um, and I know Stuart mentioned there the equality and diversity. We do have um, an NTTF2 bid in just now with the Scottish Government and part of that is working with organisations such as Equate Scotland, um, such as AFBE Scotland to look after ethnic minority engineers. Um, and I had a meeting last week with Autism Scotland, looking at how we support um, equality, diversity and protected characteristics within the manufacturing sector. Uh, in terms of, you know, those kind of making it easy for companies to get involved in training and, and people having less time, we're, we've got a bid in just now to do develop a micro-credentials program where people can enter from as little as um, two credit unit, and that can build up to a 20 credit unit. Uh, and we have, as you would expect, got provision to, to develop content in the green and low carbon and, and carbon literacy areas. So quite a lot going on. There is a lot going on, Stuart. Thank you for summarising that very succinctly. And the EDI agenda, as it were, that's really important. I'm glad you raised that today. That's a really important piece, particularly in the manufacturing engineering community that we all need to focus on going forward. So, so thank you, Stuart, for those insights. So Sam Turner, HVMC, just, just moving on to yourself, Sam. Um, there's been a substantial amount of activity within HVMC. We've all been kind of part of that, being part of MS, being part sorry, of the, one of the seven centres across the UK. So I'd just like your insights and thoughts, really, some around the collective response that HVMC has undertaken during the pandemic, and particularly the excellent work around the ventilator challenge. So over to you, Sam. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, I thought your presentation earlier on, on the MS response was excellent. Great response for Scottish businesses and the response to support the NHS as well. And, and similar responses around our centres. So we're very quickly, if you don't know, with the, the age of the Castle Network, we've got to uh, work our way south. From uh, Glasgow, we've got the Centre for Post Innovation at Teesside, uh, which is doing all the work for the vaccine schedule, actually. So we've then got the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in the Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in Sheffield, doing quite a lot of work on, on masks and on ventilator components. And we've got the Manufacturing Technology Centre in Coventry, which was again working on ventilator components and also building incubation, incubation shields, should I say, uh, for tech doctors. For Ventilators. Um, we have one manufacturing group doing all the work on uh, testing devices. Also, actually, in fact, most sensors you've been describing, but uh, it's great work with the OP people getting companies to get restarted. The one in back, I guess, about 12 months when companies look at how do we get back up to rate, how do we work in a constrained environment where we've got the COVID distancing rules to work to. We saw actually a bit of automation coming in as well, simulation. And reduce their stock countries of my chain. Um, and then the National Composite Centre in Bristol. Again, oh, so Sam, could I just interrupt you slightly? The sound quality has gone. Oh, sorry, Sam, can you hear me? Yeah, I 
can, yeah. Yeah, the, your sound quality was just dropping a bit. Is there any way we can get either closer to the microphone or? Sorry, I don't know if that, anyone else that, has got the same challenge. But... Is that any better? Yeah, that seems a little bit better. Yeah, that's better. Thank you, Sam. Okay, sorry. If, if, if it's better, I can just cut out and get some headphones as well. I'll crack on. Tell me if I need to get headphones. Yeah, ca carry on, Sam, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so yeah, so the National Company Centre of Bristol are seventh centre. So, yeah, well, great response from UK manufacturing and uh, really good response from our sensors as well. Uh, and then collectively, we were working on the ventilators in St. Chris. That was something that was, we had the, the challenge came in from Boris Johnson and Michael Dome, the UK industry, to step up and produce, I think the ask was for about 40,000 ventilators in the UK. And that was quite a challenge for you know, the sector that was pretty much on hold at that stage, when it's back in shuts. And we had a consortium that we ended up leading. So our, CEO of Big LC, put together consortium of mostly aerospace and automotive or other sport companies to build the ventilators that we were asked for and that's quite a the challenges to turn those around in about two, two months. I think over, over three months, we saw we produced um, nearly 14,000 ventilators. So we scaled up the device from Pedalon uh, and also from uh, Smith. So Pedalon ESO2 ventilator device, which was modified. Smith Power Pack Plus as well. Um, two facilities that were effectively working with the SMEs with no way they can scale now and support sort of people together. So we ended up with three and a half thousand people going in their space and automotive firms assembling devices. Um, people were making 400 devices a day, and this was all stepped up from nothing over a three month period. So it was a phenomenal response. We had the advantage, I suppose, of factory being shut and supply chains being able to turn. So for sort of the components we were producing for the Smith's device, as with from the Smith's uh, power pack device. Um, so we started to reverse engineer the device, create the joint specs, um, and try to find where we can make them. So we were going around you know, what people have the machine tools that produce the components that are required. Um, phenomenal response from supply chains around the UK, a lot of aerospace companies turning up to make the ventilator parts at that volume scale, including some of our sensors. Produced prototypes on some of the scale parts as well. So it was um, yeah, outstanding response, really. The, the focus that we're going to have. So we, we're getting um, MHRA approval as well uh, for the Pemlock device in three weeks. So this is the thing that take on. The whole scale up would normally be probably a couple of years of work. So we did, I think it's something we learned actually around, which I hope the learning will become embedded across the Gen manufacturing and catalog, just around agility and focus. Um, and there's also the sense of genuinely desperate desire to save lives. People seem to work with us and work with guys today. And you could obviously sleep at night and sleep one month or two months with that great, almost sort of wartime spirit of uh, coming together to, to address a national challenge. So um, I've saw digital tools with a huge part of that. Automation, we're using augmented reality to help train workers on the shop floor. We're used to working to aerospace staff now with to medical staff. Discrete event simulation to optimize layouts for the new facilities. So we stood up seven uh, assembly facilities around the country and also reconfigured the existing facilities at Smith's and Pembroke as well. And then, and then sourcing um, globally at the interest rates where we're hitting, and in some sense, competition with, with other ventilator consortiums, <coughs> um, trying to get you know, factories in Italy and whatnot now to come back on over the weekend to produce crucial parts for the first prototypes. So it was, it was an incredible experience. Um, phenomenal results, very hard work, but it did show what can be done uh, with that sense of focus, focus, and focus, and the opportunities to have to streamline new product developments. Simon, in terms of that, it was a monumental effort across, like you said, many organisations, Catapult were at the heart of this as well. Is, is there any summary of that kind of Less, well, what, what happened, lessons learned in the way forward? Has, has there been any case study pulled together, anything that could be shared with this community? Because it'd be nice to actually c capture it as part of the, a link with the presentations that will be issued after the session. Uh, yes, I believe there was. I'll, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Chris yeah, share it with the online. So there was some good outputs uh, so later, some of the key messages. I think there's more to be done there. There's a lot of work. Perhaps we need to look at how we take that forward more proactively to manufacture particularly the, the, the rapid scale of certification, the repurposing 
money on it. Yeah. Which I know is something we've seen across the sector, not just on ventilating money. Yeah, and it, that rapid certification, as we talked about the MS support earlier on, that was one of the key feedbacks from industry that helping to guide them through that environment, the frameworks, what, what what's available, also the you know the actual insights and the knowledge of individuals that can help them take them through that journey is really important, really valuable to help expedite that kind of route to market, as it were, I guess, in summary. Okay, we're, we're rapidly coming to the end of the session, and I, what I'd just like to do is really thank everyone on, who's been online today from witnessing what's been discussed today from the present present uh, presentations that we've given. So thank you, Jill, Chin and Tom, very much appreciated. I'd very much like to thank my colleague, Olga Fluenska, who's not here today, but she very much pulled all this together on our behalf. So big thank you, Olga, if when you watch this back, must mention that. And of course, to all the panelists as well. So thank you very much, Stuart Strachan from Scottish Government. Tim, Tim, thank you very much for your support as well. Stuart from Manufacturing Skills Academy. Alan Norbury, of course, from Siemens, and Sam Turner as well from the High Valley Manufacturing in Cathport. So, uh, this is set. So, this will conclude today's session, which is What Have We Learned from COVID? Opportunities and Insights for Manufacturing Regeneration. So, I thank you all for your time once again, and all the best. Take care and keep well. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.